Hello, my name is Abigail Walters. I am a current student with California University of Pennsylvania in the Masters of Education in School Counseling program. Um, I'm also um, a part of the HRSA OWEP program this semester as well. And first of all, I wanna say welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, today, I'm going to be talking to you about stress. Um, whether it is a fact of life, simply a requisite for being human in the 21st century, or whether it is a physiological response that we may be able to play an active role in. So let's jump right in. I bet if I asked a room of people right now, how many of them had ever felt stressed before, each one would raise their hands. I guarantee we've all felt stress regarding one thing or another in our lives. But I also feel like the more stress we experience, the more we come to be complacent to it. The more we accept it as a facet of our lives, something that comes and goes, or maybe even something that stays mutely in the background. For some of us, that is. We live in a very stressful world, just to put it blunt bluntly. Even prior to 2020, when the pandemic erupted, levels of stress and anxiety reported by the average person had risen exponentially since 1990. To give you some numbers on that, in a study from 2010, 44% of adults reported increased levels of stress in their day-to-day -day lives. However, now in a report from 2020, 2021, um, actually just from last month, 77% of adults reported both physical and psychological symptoms of stress. Um, and, and there could be lots of reasons for it. It could be financial struggle. It could be changes in family or relationship dynamics, um, and such as changing expectations that may exist now. It could even be due to the rapid changes in technology that we experience among so many other things. We are living in a pandemic, so the list can go on and on. But when it comes to technology, having constant access to information can definitely have its advantages. It's a catch-22 for sure. But having it at your constant access also means you don't get a break from it. And that isn't something that's going to go away. Our society has boomed technologically, even within the last year, simply because of the pandemic and our virtual existence. So stress, I mean, it's become so common that it's become commonplace. It's become as mundane as being tired. It's just something that happens. So do we just keep getting more and more stressed as society continues to change and evolve? Do we, are we just doomed to be stressed and anxious for the rest of our lives? It doesn't have to be that way. So how does stress happen? Stress and the stress response system, I could call also the fight or flight response. Um, I've also heard it said the fight, flight, or freeze response. Um, it has evolved as a mechanism for survival, and that's fine. But as our definition of survival has changed and the obstacles that we face, our stress changes as well. So in our current state of society, we are facing chronic stress. So living in that constant survival mode can have a direct impact on your health. It can impair your long-term wellness, both physically and mentally. So also let it be known and let it, you know, for the record, we do have a tendency to overreact sometimes in our day-to-day. -day. We receive so much stimulation from all around us, again, with all that access to information. However, we don't have proper ways that we are using to cope with that, with the stress, with the emotions, with the stimulation in our everyday. So we become rip-roaring angry in traffic, or we snap at our family members um, or our pets or something. Um, so yes. 
let's move on to the stress response system. So it is a, a system and that's what I am here to try and reiterate today. Um, stress is not just like being happy or being sad or feeling good. It is a whole neurological and physiological system that happens in our body with its own pathway of um, organization in the organs in the body. So it is not just this abstract thing. It's very real. It, it, it happens in our bodies. It starts in the brain. So it starts with the recognition of a stressor, something that causes us stress. And so our senses in the moment, our eyes and our ears, send that sensory information to an, a body in the brain called the amygdala. Um, it is an area known for emotional processing. When the amygdala senses danger, and again, our definitions of stress and our stressors have changed over time, but when our amygdala senses those stressors or those dangers, it signals to the hypothalamus, another body in the brain, which serves as our fight or flight command center. It is what operates the whole system. So the hypothalamus is the area of the brain which would communicate with the rest of the body via something called the autonomic nervous system, or as I like to say, the automatic nervous system, because it is associated with the actions that are involuntary, such as breathing, digestion, etc. So the autonomic nervous system divulges then into two other parts, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. To break it down in very simple terms, the sympathetic nervous system is like the gas pedal when it comes to fight, flight, or freeze. It's going to speed that up. It's going to trigger that. The parasympathetic nervous system is or would be considered the breaks in the system. Once the danger has passed, once the situation is no longer stressful, the parasympathetic nervous system would be activated in order to slow things down and mitigate the fight, flight, or freeze response. So the hypothalamus, our command center, activates the sympathetic nervous system. Again, we're uh, stimulating the fight, flight, or freeze response. Um, by sending signals to the adrenal glands, which sit right on top of our kidneys. The adrenal glands release a hormone called epinephrine, which we would know commonly as adrenaline. And adrenaline, as we know and have most likely all experienced, triggers a cascade of physiological reactions, such as high blood pressure, shortness of breath, breath, and increased heart rate. So at this point, that is all phase one of the stress response system in our bodies. That is basically short-term stress. Um, when we're so scared, when we're scared, when we're surprised, when something spooks us, um, when we are asked a difficult question, things like that, those are short-term. But phase two is where more long-term and eventually chronic stress comes into play. So phase two, um, otherwise known as the HPA axis, involves the hypothalamus, pituitary gland, and adrenal glands. And it is responsible for keeping that gas pedal pressed down as long as the brain continues to perceive a situation as dangerous or stressful. So the hypothalamus, again, our command center here, expels a hormone called corticotropin releasing hormone which ultimately travels to the pituitary. And in response, the pituitary gland releases adrenocorticotropic hormone. And then that ACTH travels to the adrenal glands, prompting them to release cortisol. And cortisol is our bad guy here. He's the villain. He's what leads to chronic stress. So in chronic long-term stress, the HPA axis, that phase two stays activated for long periods of time meaning that cortisol is continuing to be released. Um, and it can lead to clogging up of um, other systems within our bodies. Um, so research, research has stated that low levels of chronic stress 
um, which again is that when cortisol is constantly being released, can lead to high blood pressure, the formation of ar artery clogging deposits, and um, brain changes, which can then inspire things like depression, anxiety, and addiction. So again, short-term versus long-term. Our short-term stress response is that phase one where we might feel worried, we might feel escalated, like we're unable to switch off. Our hearts may beat fast, our breathing may quicken. We may have an upset belly from the rush of hormones. Um, we, our muscles may even tense up. And then on the long-term, all of those things for a prolonged period of time lead to things such as tension headaches, migraines, mental health problems, heart problems, panic attacks, um, an increased risk of type 2 diabetes, fertility problems, and also, I'll add one at the end, problems in immunity, our immune systems. So I feel like all I've talked about right now <laughs> up till this point are all the things that um, can go wrong as a result of stress, which you know, I am not denying as a facet of life. I'm just saying we can do something about it. So my presentation has not been hopefully all about the doom and gloom. It's about how we can be active participants in our lives to counter what would ultimately be chronic stress without any attention. So in my perspective, a holistic approach is going to be most appropriate and maybe most effective in a lot of cases. Um, we are all different, so our stress may look different, as well as how we com combat that. So a holistic approach can look like the incorporation of physical activities such as yoga, meditation, tai chi, qigong, things of that nature. Um, also social supports, weathering, whether it is adding some to the mix or strengthening those which already exist between family, friends, clubs, groups, etc. Also traditional therapy, um, as I've said, the stress response is all about the processing of information, whether we continue to process something as stressful or not. That could have a lot, um, could find a lot of help within traditional therapy in a traditional therapy setting. Just having sort of a third party eye, third party perspective to help you process some of those things. And as always, a lifestyle and diet modification may be of interest even before things such as psychopharmaceuticals be considered. Um, and all of these things, all of the things that go into a holistic approach, um, even some of those things in the photo, deep breathing, getting good, adequate sleep, socializing, exercise, they all boil down to mindfulness. We can't just go through the motions of these things and hope that they work for us and that they address our stress and our mental wellness. No, you have to actually be present in it. You have to give it your attention. You have to confront what you're doing, the present. So that is the most important part of trying to combat this stress and these um, suggestions I'm giving. So mindfulness is all about going from a mindset of doing, such as that fight, flight, or freeze response, to a mindset of being, which is about being in the present, not ruminating about the past or worrying about the future. And in that being, in that being more present in your thoughts, you become more aware of them, your needs, your emotions, as well as that of others. Um, in that, you may become less reactive to situations in the moment because you're slowing them down to be more aware of the process of thoughts, feelings, actions, etc. But also because we spent all this time talking about the neurological, physiological uh, system of stress, I also want to throw a little bit more science in here and say that mindfulness, being present in the moment in these activities also reduces um, activity in the amygdala, which again is that emotional processing center, which determines whether something is a stressor or not. Um, and so as we have learned, it is essential in stimulating the stress response. So as I am a counselor to be, I'll always be a big proponent of mental wellness, of therapy, of lifestyle changes, everything like that, everything that contributes to mental wellness, but also as somebody who has a background in neuroscience, 
um, not necessarily education, even though that's the degree I'm pursuing right now. I also have a passion for how our physical wellness, our mental wellness, our spiritual wellness all come together um, to form our realities. So this is how I brought them all together for you today. And hopefully one day I'll be able to go even farther on with it. But thank you. And here are some resources.